Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. Uh, it is so good to have everybody back here uh, in the sanctuary. We've got a good crowd here this morning. And it is also good to have everyone back online and those of you that are watching from home. Uh, you see the link there uh, or see the web address there on the front of the pulpit, ogfmc.com. Go there if you've stumbled across us and check out our website and uh, learn a little bit more about us. We'd love to have you be with us. Uh, we are a friendly group of people for the most part. We've got a couple of grouches, but every church has those. <laughs> but we'd, uh, we'd love to have you be part of our, our online family and our in-person family. So just uh, make yourself at home. We have been taking a look um, over the past few weeks covering a sermon series titled God With Us. And today we're looking at the, the whole focus of joy. Now, when it when you think about joy, I want to give you a mental image. Are you ready for this? Have you ever received or given a puppy for Christmas? You ever done that? I'm sure that you've seen it on television and commercials. A super cute, tiny, cuddly fuzzball is usually wearing a bright red bow around his neck, and it usually comes bounding around the corner or peeks its head out of the box as soon as the kids or special someone lifts the loosely fitted lid. It's always adorable and it starts giving kisses 
or tumbling out out of the box and trying to walk on oversized feet. You ever notice that? Puppies' feet are always bigger than they need. And if you've ever seen a uh, German Shepherd or a Lab or a Rottweiler and you look at the size of their feet and realize that they're going to grow into those feet, you realize the size of the dog. But if you've ever been involved in one of these, in this Christmas morning puppy gift, it's an interesting ritual that you have to go through. First of all, a puppy does not want to be contained in the box, right? Does not want to be in there. You can't wrap him up the week before Christmas and put him under the tree. That's not going to work. You have to work to keep him hidden, especially if you had picked him up before Christmas morning, you know, because the, the breeder or the shelter is not always open on Christmas morning. Now, I did know that there were some that they would come in and actually hand out the puppies for the people that, that adopted them early Christmas morning. I always thought that was a neat thing. But sometimes you have to hide this puppy somewhere outside your house. So that required you to have a special friend <laughs> that was willing to take that little bundle of energy and hold them for you. And then you have to wait until exactly one minute before the kids come down the stairs to drop the doggy into the box, bribe him with a treat, and hope that you can keep him in there for at least 30 seconds to time it just right. Some people skip the box altogether and just wait around the corner and turn the puppy loose. And puppy will always find people talking. And when they come running around the corner, it's fun. And it's, it is just so exciting. And to hear the squeals of the children if it's their puppy. But the, the point is the puppy is uncontainable in a box, comes spilling out to love and lick everyone that's around, and it doesn't stop there. If you've ever received a puppy, don't you find that as you're going around visiting your family and friends, you take that little bundle of joy with you because you know you can't leave it at home alone, right? Mm -hmm. So you're carrying this little ball of fluff around to show him off to everybody. They pass him around. They may walk you over to introduce him to the neighbors, you drive it to relatives or friends, you may even take it to the hair salon, ladies, if you're going to have a permanent put in your hair. They want to share and show off this adorable little ball for as long as they can with as many people as they can. They want to go grab their kids, their husband, and say, look at this. Isn't this amazing? Look at this little guy. Well, joy is a lot like puppies. Now you're looking at me right now saying, I've never heard the pastor compare the joy of Christmas to a puppy. Bear with me. Fortunately, it's not as hairy. Doesn't make a mess. But joy is boundless and uncontainable when it's genuine. Joy overflows. When you experience it, you want to share it with someone else or as many people as you can because joy, by its very nature, bubbles out. And you can see it on people's faces. Now, if you've been taking this trip with us over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at this. And if you're here for the very first time this morning and you say, you know, I didn't catch the other two sermons, OGFMC.com. The sermon video is there. You can get all caught up. But just to recap, Advent means coming or arrival, and the season is marked by expectating, expectation, waiting, anticipation, and longing. That's the four things that we cover in every aspect as we are taking this march towards Christmas. But Advent also gives us an opportunity to recognize and realize that Jesus came originally as a result of a promise, right? He was the promised Messiah. And just as was promised, he came. In the same way, he promised to come again. So we still have anticipation 
of Jesus coming in a return. But Advent looks back in the celebration at the hope fulfilled in Jesus' coming and looks ahead in his coming again. You know, Jesus, Emmanuel, means God with us. He is the embodiment of these traits who has entered our world and fills all who are open to him. It is a free gift. But I want us to consider for just a few moments, I've got three passages of scripture we're going to be looking at. And first of all, God shows us through Elizabeth and her life how joy overcomes shame. How can joy overcome shame? Now, you probably remember the story of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. The catch was that Zechariah and Elizabeth were old. Now, we also know that Abraham and Isaac were old, and they were promised a child, and they had a child. But Zechariah and Elizabeth New Testament, God still does things in the New Testament. Elizabeth was beyond childbearing years, and the couple were never able to have children. So for our first passage, I want us to look at Luke chapter 1, verses 6 through 15. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and it's going to pop up on the screen in front of you, those of you at home. And it says this, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. It's an interesting story, isn't it? An interesting story. Now, whether or not you have realized it, Zachariah and Elizabeth's son named John was going to be John the Baptist. John the Baptist, who was to prepare the way for Jesus, the Messiah. And Zachariah was a priest who had a visit from an angel. So besides the shock from talking to an angel, Zachariah couldn't get over the fact that it was possible for his wife to have a baby. Now, that not only was exciting for his wife, I'm sure that that made Zechariah feel pretty good about things. Right? So as a result, when he doubted or, or laughed or questioned, we don't know exactly what his total reaction was, but just to make a point, the angel said, all right, you think that that's uh, a little far-fetched, do you? Well, you're not going to be able to talk until the baby's born. Wife pregnant, he's the father, a couple beyond childbearing age, and he's not able to talk. Wow. So, now let's look at Elizabeth. In the story of God with us, she deeply experienced joy in the midst of miraculous events that she found herself suddenly surrounded. This was an interesting situation for her. To understand Elizabeth's joy, however, 
we have to understand her pain because it wasn't just the fact that she could not bear a child. There's a whole lot of cultural background to that fact that you need to understand. You see, for the ancient Jews, children were a tremendous blessing. Psalm 127 tells us children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward from Him. So it's a blessing from God. Children allowed a family to pass on its name and heritage. They provide more hands to do the work of the family. But most importantly, children were viewed as a gift from God and a sign of God's favor. Okay, you with me? A sign of God's favor. So to be childless then was a source of frustration, sorrow, and shame. And Elizabeth would have known this despair for years. She had to live with this. The community would know. She would most likely have been married to Zachariah when she was young, probably a teenager. That was the custom then. And they would have no doubt hoped to have children right away. And yet, nothing. Elizabeth probably would have imagined what it would be like to have a home filled with kids. She would have dreamed of holding her own babies. She might have made lists of names in her mind, drawing from the family names that would be passed traditionally down family lines. <clears throat> you know what that's like. If you are parents, you know the excitement, and you would also recognize the disappointment if that could not be. But now at first, Elizabeth might have dismissed the lack of pregnancy. Maybe the timing just wasn't quite right, she's thinking. Maybe. Or maybe there had been a miscarriage from a previous pregnancy, and she experienced the heartache of that. Who knows how long it took, but gradually, year after year, Elizabeth's hope would have slowly died as she came to the realization that we are probably not going to have children. Now comes society. People would get involved. The word barren would be tacked on to her to everyone that knew her or recognized her. It became shameful, and no doubt it left a permanent mark in her life. She would have grieved over the loss of ever being a mother. She would have accepted the lost status that came to her culture. She would never be considered as worthy or esteemed as other women that had had children. So she accepted her fate as a failure in the eyes of society. See, we don't often think of the background of these people. We just hear the story, and sometimes this time of year, we just kind of gloss over it. There's a lot of meat here. But in an ordinary day, keep that in mind, an ordinary day with Zechariah at work in the temple, the angel showed up gave him this word. He couldn't go home and tell his wife. How in the world do you sign that out? If you've ever played Pictionary, I mean, he'd draw pictures, make hand motions, and it was probably true that Elizabeth probably didn't have the ability of reading or writing. So if he could even write out a message, she couldn't read it. Wow. What do you do? But an ordinary day. And when she finally caught on, she was probably thinking she got the wrong message. Well, you know how Zachariah is. You know, he does tend to, you know, stretch the truth a little bit from time to time. But then, maybe she started thinking, you know, this is too good to be true. Really? 
She would feel that thump in her heart of hope. Could she even allow herself to experience that type of joy? But then she comes to the realization and she says, the Lord has done this for me in these days. He has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. But what's curious is the book of Luke tells us that Elizabeth spent the first five months of her pregnancy in seclusion. First five months. I'd like to be able to tell you why. Don't have any information there, but maybe she knew that no one would believe her until she was finally showing. Right? Let's not make a big deal out of this until we really know what's happening here. Maybe she had been there before. You know, we talked about a miscarriage. Maybe she was afraid that this pregnancy might be lost like earlier ones. And she just could not go through the shame and the disappointment again. But maybe this was her way of sharing her husband's silence. After all, you know, he's been a chatty Cathy this whole time, and now he can't talk. Some wives would really like that. <laughs> but maybe she was sharing in her husband's silence as they both were living through a miracle in the making before them. Well, we do know that in her sixth month of pregnancy, Elizabeth experienced a deep encounter with joy brought by the coming Messiah whose human life had just sprung into being in Mary's womb. Okay, here's where the story takes another twist. Now, last week we talked about Mary visiting Elizabeth. And we remember that the baby leapt in Elizabeth's womb just at the sound of Mary's voice. An unborn child reacting to the sound of Mary's voice. <laughs> So with a sudden end to her silence and seclusion, Elizabeth's joy finally overflowed. And she greeted with Mary with an insightful blessing. Blessed are you among women, she says. <laughs> well, to go back to my original analogy, the puppy is now out of the box, <laughs> right? Joy was flowing and true to its nature, joy was contagious. And then Mary burst into her own song of praise. But Elizabeth understood and believed and affirmed without Mary even having to say anything. God was working. So already, Emmanuel, God with us, was unleashing joy on the earth, and already his joy began rippling outwards. Now, we don't get the opportunity to go back and revisit everything with Zechariah and Elizabeth of society's reaction. We do know that when it came time for, when the baby John the Baptist was born, that when it came time to name the baby, they really thought that the baby was going to be named Zechariah after his father. And Zechariah, no. And he asked for a note, and he wrote, his name is John. And the people would have probably gasped, why John? And immediately Zechariah was able to speak. Huge story going on here. So all of this is going on and how it affected society was the ripples, which comes to the second point. God reveals our source, source of joy. Where does it come from in our life? How do we get there? What would you and I give to know such overwhelming joy that you wouldn't even have adequate words to express it? What would you be willing to give for joy like that? To see the scars and shame of our life washed away so dramatically, most likely we won't see it happen through such an obvious miracle as this. And 
please don't go home telling everybody that the pastor said, well, I'm beyond childbearing age, I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> now, if an angel appears to you and your husband, just let us know. But the joy that Elizabeth experienced is available. This is the joy brought into our world by Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. So though we are living a long past his time on earth, his life and his joy are available to us now. And I want us to look at 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, it says this. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. So an inexpressible and joyous glory, if you will, a glorious joy. That goes deeper than happiness, doesn't it? We all love to be happy. We love to feel good. But happiness comes and goes as the circumstances around us change by the hour and by the minute, doesn't it? You ever had one of those times when you've just been on cloud nine? You've been on the top of the peak. And then you receive word about something and it, your joy just nosedived. And you wonder... Oh, how am I ever going to do this? Happiness comes and goes by circumstance. And it can be many things, birthday parties, balloons, your favorite song on a perfect summer day, an encouraging message from a friend, winning a big game, even if you're not from Ohio. <laughs> a delicious meal, have you ever been delighted? to sit down at a table and realize, oh, I can't believe it. this is fantastic. These are good and enjoyable things to be savored and enjoyed, but every one of them is fleeting. Why? Because it's temporary satisfaction. That's not joy, that's happiness. And pursuing happiness for the sake of happiness can be a shallow, self-centered pursuit. Viktor Frankl wrote this, it's the very pursuit of happiness that thwarts happiness. He wrote that in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Joy includes happiness, but it goes deeper than just happiness. Joy is what fills our soul. It's what transforms us. In our lives, the stuff of joy looks like the birth of a child. The birth of a child, your wedding day, being declared free from cancer, a loved one or a family friend coming out of a coma with no brain damage and no ill effects. Joy, you see, is rooted in gratitude, meaning and hope fulfilled, especially when it's based in a relationship with God. <clears throat> That's where it finds its source. With his life and the promise of eternal life beyond this world, we find the deep kind of joy that fills us no matter the pain that we're currently going through. Joy can survive through pain. And the world does not understand that. Peter called it an inexpressible and glorious joy that is part of the inheritance that we receive in Christ. With his life and the promise of eternal life, we find that deep-rooted joy in our soul. So as our eyes turn expectantly to this Christmas season and the day that we're going to celebrate his coming, we have a lot to consider and a lot to realize. 
We can know with confidence that even a greater under, unending joy awaits us one day. One day we will receive all that God has for us in full. Now I've got a little bit of news here for you. It's not going to be this side of heaven. When we finally are in the presence of God, we will find ultimate joy fulfilled in the glorious presence of God. Like Nehemiah of the Old Testament, the Jewish leader who faced great odds in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, we can experience the truth that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah having to rebuild the walls that had been demolished but God spoke to him, and he realized, I need to get to work. And because of his faithful service to God, God fulfilled the truth in the people's lives. So joy lasts even in the midst of the worst of things, which comes to the next point. The joy defies our circumstances. You say, well, I don't know. Now, we compared happiness and joy a few moments ago, but there's one defining characteristic of joy that I hope you take away, and it's the fact that joy actually defies circumstance. No matter what we're going through, no matter where we find ourselves, joy can still be there. Happiness comes and goes with events, as I said, but joy flows deep even in the face of challenge hardships and suffering joy drawn from jesus god with us sees the bigger picture beyond immediate pain there's more to this life than just this stuff and we need to realize that our joy comes from outside of ourself that's poured into our soul by god himself and that comes bubbling forth you cannot contain the joy of the Lord in your life. If you try, you're going to bust something. Something's going to tear. You ever been in a situation where somebody tells you, now, we have to be serious, don't laugh. You ever been in one of those? Then all of a sudden, all you want to do is laugh. And if you have one of your good friends with you, God help you both. <laughs> Because you can't look at each other. You can't say anything. And even when you're trying really hard to not make a sound, you still have that... <clears throat> right? So with that thought in mind, I want to look at James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Joy understands, you see, that there is more than what meets the eye. God is at work. God will make everything right and healed and whole, including us. So because of that, we can experience joy in the here and now, in the midst of whatever we're going through, because joy, remember, is not tied to circumstance. Which makes me ask a question. What are the circumstances that you're facing now? What's going on in your mind and in your heart as we're approaching this Christmas? What are the situations that are stealing your joy? What is it that's robbing joy out of your life? Or the hurts where pain always seems to overrule and you can't move beyond those disappointments? Now, I don't mean to make light of what you're going through, and I know full well that pain is a reality for everyone in one way or another, but I encourage you to ask God to give you a different view. Not all of those things can be taken away, can they? 
Some of those things are endured. But we can ask God to give us a different view to show us his big picture. Now, you may not experience a miracle like Elizabeth, Mary. But this message of the angel long ago announced the arrival to Christ to terrified shepherds. <laughs> we always hear, and, and the shepherds were terrified. So in the midst of their terror, the angel brings good news of great joy, he says. In the midst of their terror came the message of joy. Don't be afraid, he says. I bring you good news that will cause great joy, not only for the shepherds there, but to all people. That means they had to go tell somebody. Does that sound like that was a bunch of terrified, gloomy shepherds to you? Not at all. They deliberately told what the angel said, which brings me to my final point. Joy is a choice. Now bear with me. I had a hard time unpacking that. But God teaches us that joy is a choice. Joy can also be an action. Not just in what you're feeling, but in how you live. We've talked about Mary and we've talked about Elizabeth. How they were overcome with joy. How Mary was overcome with joy. Mary says he, God took notice of his lowly servant girl. These are important words with the key word in both cases being rejoice. It's the active form of joy, the verb. And this is Mary choosing and embracing joy in the role that she'd been given by God. She didn't have to. <laughs> when you think about it, Mary was in a tight spot. Remember those, you know, it kind of reminds me of a story or an illustration. Remember those cartoons of all of the troops standing up in formation and the drill sergeant comes out and they've got a really difficult mission that they need somebody to go do. And so they ask for a volunteer. And in unison, everyone takes one step backwards except the guy in the front row. We call that being volunteered, right? <laughs> so he got volunteered. Mary could have looked at her situation a little bit like that. Nowhere did Mary ever ask to be the mother of God's son. She didn't ask for it. If she had been, <laughs> she would have probably taken a step back and said, no, 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 no. But in Mary's words, we see her response. She rejoices. She chooses joy. And like I said a few moments ago, she focused on the big picture and embraces her role, which will be a difficult one. You say, oh, well, how could it be a difficult role? She's She's going to have a baby, and the baby is Jesus. He's the Son of God, and all the shepherds and the three kings, the, the star and the angels and all of this. What an amazing thing. How can you call that difficult? Because she would watch her son grow up, become a man. demonstrate his earthly ministry. Oh, she would see the miracles. She was there for his first one. The turning of the water into wine at the marriage in Canaan. But you also have to understand she was at the cross. Now, for just a moment, we could not imagine 
watching our child dying in front of us by the actions of someone else. But down deep inside, Mary knew that Jesus was her Savior too. So when I say that she would be going through a difficult role, it wasn't just cuddling with that little baby. It was her whole life. In a similar way in our own situations and seasons, you know, we can do the same. We can choose joy by seeing the bigger picture. We can rejoice. We can embrace the miracle of God with us and align our vision with the work that he is doing in and through us because you see, you are a vessel of God's message. Same way with Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, John the Baptist. You are still a vessel of the message of hope of God with us. The Bible is filled with verses exhorting and encouraging us to rejoice, probably because we all need plenty of reminders. Oh, can't you see the bright side of anything, right? You ever heard that? Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Romans 12.12, 12, rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying, it says. These are only the beginning, but the message and takeaway is the same. We have reason for joy because God is with us. So let's each one of us choose to be joyful. Let us rejoice as we await figuratively the arrival of Jesus at this time of year in the Christmas season. But let us also rejoice in the hope of his ultimate return and coming. God is with us, and so joy is with us, a joy that flows deep within our spirits and outward because our King, our Savior, is with us, always loving, always working, even in the midst of any hardship that we are facing or ever will face. God remains unchanged, and joy is the gift that he brings to each one of us. Amen? Amen? Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you, and we do have that joy in our hearts. Sometimes, Lord, it gets a little dull. Sometimes we need to polish it up a bit. Sometimes we need to allow it to shine to those around us instead of hoarding it to ourselves. Help us to see the joy in this season. Help us to see the joy in our life that only you can give and bring forth. Touch us afresh and anew, I pray, with your hand of joy, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.